One of the biggest factors for having fun in franchise mode is being able to scout and draft successfully, getting those brand new rookies onto the team that have the high upside. adds a lot of excitement to the mode. And in MLB The Show, they changed the scouting formula in the last game. And this new formula, it has been pretty difficult for a lot of people. They do not make a lot of the strategies known unto you. They kind of throw you in the deep end and make you figure it out yourself. Well, in this video, I'm going to show you a strategy that has worked very well for me to not only get good value at the top of the drafts, that part's a little bit easier, but to get value throughout the board. And if you use this formula, you're going to have a lot more success in the draft. And this video, I'm going to give you a step by step process. I'm going to take you through an entire season of scouting in this own franchise series with the Los Angeles Angels, and we'll see what kind of draft we get. So let's hop into it now. Now, the first step that is crucial in terms of getting yourself successful draft classes is to get good scouts. And if you're unaware of how to get to the scout contrast screen, it's up here with the shaking hands, staff contracts and scouts. Now, this is what I do with my scouts every single year. The first scout you're going to want to hire, I put this guy in the third spot. It doesn't really matter. I just like to put them in the spot that they're going to appear on the weekly scouting screen. And you're going to go to the very bottom. You're going to go from the bottom up and you're going to find the cheapest scout with 90 discovery that you could find in the available pool. Now, there are not a lot of good cheap discovery scouts. We got unlucky this time so to get 90 discovery we have to pay 88 uh, almost 89,000. typically you can get closer into those low 80s and find a 90 plus discovery scout there will maybe even be sometimes you have to settle for 85 plus here but uh, we're gonna try to use this 93 discovery scout again i'm gonna put him here in the third spot you can put him wherever you want with the other two scouts, you're going to want a position player specialist and a pitcher specialist. And what I mean by that is you want at least 90 in efficiency and the spot you're going to scout. This guy has 90 and everything. He's an insane scout. Because we're paying so much for our discovery scout, I don't think we're going to actually be able to afford this person. But let's take, for example, Robert Roth. Very good pitching scout here 96 efficiency 97 pitchers so he's going to be our pitching specialist scout here i'm going to put this in the second spot and then we are looking for 90 plus for both the efficiency and the position players taking a look doing a little bit of quick math here we're going to have about 105 106 thousand dollars to be able to spend so we're going to try to find somebody that has 90 in both position players Ooh, we found a cheaper scout that's actually even a better pitching scout here so we're going to call an audible is what that will do is it'll give us even more money to spend on a position player scout which i think we're gonna need just with this class can we actually afford this guy we can't here we go josh mcdaniel can we afford him yes we can so this first guy, Josh McDaniel, 93 efficiency, 98 position player. He's also really good in pitchers. So if we have a very pitcher heavy class, he can jump over and help us with the pitchers. But he's going to be our position player specialist. Roger Byers, he's going to be our pitching specialist. And Brianna Lim is going to be our discovery specialist. And this is the kind of setup you want if you want to use the strategy that I'm going to recommend here in this video. Now, every Sunday, starting in the first season, it'll be April 7th. Um, it'll be, you know, the day will be different every single year. But one of these Sundays in April, you're going to start getting your scouting available. Now, you can only view this on Sundays. I feel like they should unlock at least being able to view it other days. But the number two tip that I'm going to give you here for scouting is to set your positional needs here with the right bumper. Just choose three positions that you feel like you need. If you're going to draft a pitcher, I'd always recommend having starting pitcher be one because I feel like you're probably going to take at least a couple in every draft almost. Um, and then just kind of whatever you feel like you could take. We'll do like a corner outfielder just because we might get some power there. We'll, we'll do something like this now here. 
for week number one. I always put in that number one gold slot, my position player scouts and other people will recommend that you scout position rather than individual players for position players. I just generally don't think it's a good idea. Like, let's just say I wanted to do a first base in the West. You get 15% scouting per week using this method. And if you take a look at doing it more individual, if we were just to take, for example, this guy, we get 45% for 18 year olds and it goes up more and more percentage depending on how old the player is. So you're gonna need at least three really interesting players at the position in the region you're scouting for the other way to really be of any valuable any value to you if they're all 18 year olds and that's just very very rare so i would recommend with your position player scout scout individual guys that look interesting to you in the class now my number three tip is to be able to identify early on if there are generational talents in your class they're going to be right here at the very top of the class and they're going to be 18 year olds so the fact that we're starting with a couple of 22 year olds 23 19 means to me there's not going to be a generational player in our class i will probably later on in the video find a class that does have a generational and give you more clues on how to identify and notice when you do have a generational player in your class. So here I am on a separate file than I will be for the rest of this video. I wanted to find a class that had generational talents so that I could show you how to identify them. Step one to identifying a generational talent. They're gonna be at the top of the board. Step two, they're gonna be 18 years old every single time. And for position players there is a neat trick to finding out whether or not somebody is for sure generational or Geraldo Asuncion here you can see that his vision the top of that rating is 80 and discipline is 75 fun fact for you every single position player generational prospect has exactly 60 vision 55 discipline and 65 clutch so if you see vision and discipline are five apart, that's a good key indicator that they will be generational because their vision will always be 60, their discipline will always be 55. That's five apart. So you see them five apart here. Bada boom, you've got a generational. Now, Salazar, is he generational or not? You don't know. You go in, he's at the top of the board, 18 years old vision discipline five apart so i'd be willing to bet i'd be willing to put a nice juicy bet that both of these players will be generational i want to kind of show you the scouting process for a generational player because the game tries really hard to make you think that you're not scouting a generational prospect so i will be scouting these generational prospects with sophie simon in this and this save file, I don't care what the other two are. I'm gonna be using Sophie Simon to scout both of these generational players. And I want you to see the process. It's gonna happen with every single generational player that you see. So here we are in week two. We've used one week of scouting on Geraldo Asuncion. And oh no, he's falling down the board. His potential isn't 99. It is, trust me. The game, like I said, tries very hard to make you think generational prospects aren't generational. They will always fall down the board when you scout them for one week. So you, you got to be wary of that. What you can get clued on is, as, is that his overall and his potential are 20 away. So he's likely going to be a 79 overall. Now with generationals, it could go up or down. He could be an 80, he could be a 78, but that's really all you can tell from getting one week of scouting. Let's scout him an additional week. Here we are, all of a sudden he's rising back up, but he's still not looking generational, right? That potential only goes up to 95. The weird thing about generational prospects is you need to get them to 100% and then one more week. You have to dedicate three to four, depending on how good your scout is, weeks to, the, to scouting 
a generational player if you want the accurate rating. So the question becomes, is it more valuable, as I'm gonna simulate this week right now, is it more valuable to identify a player who's generational, not scout them at all, and save those three to four weeks to find better players throughout the class, or is it more beneficial to spend all those weeks and know exactly what you're getting and confirm that this guy's generational. Now all of a sudden you're seeing it. Potential up to 80 overall. Uh, sorry, overall up to 80. Potential up to 99. Now he's looking like the generational prospect, right? Our scouts still say he's not the best player in the class. He obviously is, or at least the second one. Let's do the same thing now with Pedro Salazar. And you're gonna watch the same process happen despite the fact that we are using just an absolutely insanely good scout on this guy week one oh no he's falling down the board did we just see this two seconds before it's going to be the same thing every single time so again if you want the accurate ratings you're gonna to have to spend a lot of scouting on the player and it's just not it's just going to be a question of whether or not you want like the 100 percent guarantee if you're willing to put the three to four weeks in to guarantee that a player is generational or if you're willing to just go with your gut say he's at the top of the board he's 18 year, years old his vision and discipline are off by five yep this guy's gonna do it so as you can see this vision says 61 and this discipline discipline says 56 that tells me he's gonna be a 79 overall because both of those are going to go down, which means all of his stuff's going to go down. So um, he's going to be a 50. He's going to be a 79. And Asuncion is going to also going to be a 79. Watch. Let's see if that ends up being the case. I'll simulate to the draft. So here we are at the draft recap screen. And there you have it. 79 overall generational for Pedro Salazar and just an absolutely insane power hitter. The other guy went to the Rockies and let's find that team really quickly. I don't know how, there we are. And 79 overall with 99 potential, both 60 vision, 55 discipline and 65 clutch. You see that? 60 vision, 55 discipline, and 65 clutch. So now that I've helped you identify generational prospects, let's get back to the rest of the video. But since we don't have one in this class, what am I gonna do? I'm gonna start looking at the top of the class for kind of who are the best position players. Garrett Bronk here at number eight is the best position player on the board. And now this is gonna be my fourth tip year of this video and I think it's the most important it's the one that's going to save you the most time of any other pit uh, any other tip here in this video is to pay attention to the gap between overall and potential of these players not a lot of people know this but with these scales every single rating ends up at the same spot in the scale for every person Let's take Garrett Bronk, for example. Let's just say he is a 65 overall, okay? Let's just say that's the case. 65 overall is five less than his max overall here on his uh, overall range, which means his potential will be five lower than the max is. So if he's 65 overall, he will have 94 potential. Furthermore, every single rating that you see here on his card will be five lower than the max rating that you see current. Um, I would honestly never really pay attention to the future ratings because MLB The Show doesn't really accurately predict what somebody's gonna go up, right? Because what they improve or decrease throughout their career largely just depends on how they perform. That's one of the best parts about the show is people progress as they perform not just a blank slate they're going to do it no matter what you have to train them and they have to perform for them to really get better always look at present so if he's 65 overall that means he's going to have 50 contact rights 33 contact left 
42 power right and 39 power left, etc., etc. down the board, take five less than the max, and you know everything about his ratings, assuming you know his overall, which of course we don't. How does that help you? It helps you avoid scouting a guy like, let's see if there's one here at the top of the class. Here's a good example, starting pitcher. Looks insane, he will be terrible, I promise you. I'm gonna write his name down and we'll take a look. Is potential supposed to be high, five higher than his overall? We'll see if that's the case by the time the draft is said and done. He's ranked 26, probably gonna go in the first round. We'll see wherever he ends up going. So, here for week one, I'm gonna look for players that will likely be available around pick number eight. Garrett Bronk here, the best position player in the class by MLB rank, should be available there. You take a look at the gap between his overall and his potential. Very healthy gap, it's a gap of 29. Now, I would typically recommend a gap more in the 15 to 25 range if you're looking for a guy that's gonna have a high overall to start and be MLB ready sooner. You'll likely end up with more high B potentials with that, so if you want you know, A potential and you don't mind if it takes longer to get there, but you want that A potential, I would look for gas more in the 20 to 30 range. Again, you like more MLB caliber talents and are, ready, and are willing to sacrifice a little bit of potential, maybe get high B rather than A, go for more of that 15 to 25 range. If you just want that A potential, go more of that 20 to 30 range is where you want to talk about. This guy, likely to be more of a long-term project, but could be really good. We'll scout him just because he's a top 10 talent. Now, four pitchers. This, very contrary to position players, you do want to scout as a whole because getting 15% on a bunch of players is better than getting 45% on one player. And you'll see why just how many pitchers you're scouting. I'd always recommend starting with international. It almost is always worth it. I think I've seen one draft in all my time playing MLB the show in the last two games where international was not one of the best two regions to scout. And then here we're going to be discovering all 14 weeks and we're going to start with pitcher international. So if we discover anyone good, they're automatically getting scouted here by our international pitcher scout. So this is the plan for week one. I'll see you in week two. We are back. For week two here, Garrett Bronx still looking pretty solid here. His ranges have gone down a little bit, but that was to be expected. Mostly a speed and fielding specialist. Not going to have anything exciting offensively, um, but still a top 10 player despite getting scouted up to 77% here. And as you can see, we're scouting 32 starting pitchers. Not all of them are going to be good. But if you say we're scouting eight or nine that are actually good players, that's worth it over scouting one at a time. We also discovered four international pitchers. We can take a look and see who those are. Do we scout anybody good? We got um, top 50 guy here, Joe Rubio. Nobody spectacular. Here's a, an example of a guy who's going to have lower potential than his overall when he comes to the uh, MLB. So that's... Not gonna be great, but nobody's spectacular yet in our discovery. Hopefully we can find some really good discovery guys just to show you just how valuable discovery is. I feel like it's underutilized in this game by many people, but um, I think Garrett Bronk, I'd like to get somebody with a little bit more offense, you know, in a top 10 pick. I wanna, I wanna get a good bat, so not gonna take him off the board entirely. We might finish off this profile later, but let's find somebody that's maybe got some offense to him what about a chris duffy i think he could be a good uh guy to scout here he's 21 years old which means we'll get him all the way up to 100 in one week he's got that potential to overall gap of 20 that's right in the sweet spot of where i like it i think we're gonna scout duffy here we're gonna leave these two spots untouched for week two i think we want more scouting on both of those aspects all right, we're here for week three, and Chris Duffy, not the kind of player we are hoping to get, unfortunately. You're going to scout a bunch of duds for sure, but uh, you hope to find at least a few gems. But 0 for 1 to start, or maybe 1 for 2. The first guy we scouted was decent enough. 
a little bit wider than I typically like here on the ranges, you know, just over 30 here, but Franz Morgan, I think could be a pretty solid contact player here. 21 years old, switch hitter. Um, I'm liking what I'm seeing here. Again, going to keep these two. Probably our last week of scout, uh, discovering international pitchers, but we're going to keep it there for now. And here we are on week four. He does rise up a little bit up the board here, but I really like what I'm seeing from Franz Morgan. Guaranteed at least 85 potential with an overall that's going to be a little bit more of a long-term project, right? Going to be in the 50s, but that's what you get when you get a guy who's overall and potential are 30 away. You're not going to get as much of an MLB-ready product, but this could be a solid round two option for us for sure. What about Andres Escalona here? 18 years old, shows a lot of power in his game, some speed as well. Not going to be much of a defender, but um, could be a really exciting offensive player. So we're going to scout him and probably likely to change this from pitcher international i was taking a look i usually do two at least two areas for pitcher the second best for us is going to be central and how i pick that is just look at some guys that look interesting at the top of the board and find out what what regions you see the most of and it's usually always at least going to be international for one of them like i said and then kind of find what that other one is it also honestly Tends to be central a lot. Sometimes you'll get west or east, but international and central is the one that I usually hit the most. And I typically go, I want to go five to six weeks with my second scout per area. Probably we're going to do five, I would guess. All right, back for week five. Andres Escalona still looking pretty good. That power versus lefties. Looks to potentially be very strong. Going to have some good speed on the base pass. I think we wrap up his profile, um, or at least get up to 95% with one more week. And we keep these other two the same. Again, want to get to five weeks here at least. Kind of see if we have a lot of guys at like 80 or 90%, then we'll do one more week. Or if we should move on to the central zone. And we're going to discover at least one or two more weeks here with the central pitchers. All right, week six, and Escalona has risen up to number 10 on our board. Certainly going to be an option for us at number eight overall. I just think you have what's going to be a really solid power speed combination, which I think could be really fun. Getting that extra 5% could be valuable just to see what his injury risk is. But I'd like to also get to know this class a little bit more and maybe find somebody we like even better than Escalona. So we're gonna do that. This has been kind of a weird class, but I'm liking Mark Phelps here. Doesn't have an arm or power, but he provides fielding contact, play skills, a little bit of speed as well. And another guy that could be available in the second round. So I'm gonna look at that. There's not a lot of very strong positional players at the top of the draft. Usually I can find a couple that I like. This draft might be the exception though. So we're going to rock with this, except I am now going to change to starting pitcher central here and we'll go from there. Looks like our discovery central scouts found a really interesting guy. Not very good velocity at all from this guy, but could be a really fun pitcher ranked number six in the class. Obviously going to keep scouting him, but that's a fun addition for sure and then now is a good time to bring up the next tip i'm going to tell you about beware of somebody going down the board just because of age so mlb the show really doesn't like older prospects and i understand why right they have less seeming upside but with the way that mlb the show's development works where it goes a lot off of MLB service time, not as much based on age as other games. Older prospects aren't as big of a stay away for me. There's obviously, you know, you'd like to go younger, but this guy's going down despite the fact that he has guaranteed a potential. So I'm not going to be scared away by this guy at all. If he's there at 44, if you can get guaranteed a, 
and in the 60s overall i mean that's a home run pick you know you may be worried about that in round one but for round two yeah mark phelps is the first guy that i'm putting on my short list um especially for that second round pick i think we get ourselves a really good infielder i also think it's time to start discovering position players here maybe we can find ourselves a gem of a position player that we could take in the first round haven't loved first round options position player that uh of the from the class you know that we've seen but maybe we can find some in discovery here we're going to start with infield international and then i'll find somebody that i want to scout over here on this side what about darren norman good overall range to potential difference of 24. um gonna have really good contact maybe decent power if he ends up on the higher end of his range not gonna be much of a defender although if it's on the higher end of his range it won't be bad either so i think he has the potential to be good or juan navarro this guy also looks good i just i guess i haven't looked at the third base there's a couple guys i want to scout here i think actually juan navarro is gonna take the first i'm gonna take the first crack at him here in week eight, Juan Navarro has fallen down the board a bit, it seems. Um, that potential not looking as good as it once did. I'm thinking... Typically when you see somebody fall that far down when they're partially scouted, it's not a good sign for things to come. When you scout them more, they might jump, but usually it's on the guys that kind of hold steady when they're 50% of the way through, and then you finish them, and then they'll jump. The guys that go down rarely come all the way back up, if you know what I mean. So if they fall a lot when you're halfway through the scouting, not always the case, especially when it comes to generationals. It's the exact opposite. They'll always go down. But with kind of the normal prospects, I guess you'll say, usually when they fall, it's a sign of bad things. So... I think we're going to be done. I was really hopeful for him, honestly. We'll go to our initial instinct at third base. Darren Norman here, another 18-year-old player. We play in California, so we'll go west next. And we're going to keep uh, Pitcher Central going for a little bit longer. Here in week nine, once again, nothing discovered in the infield. This so far has not been the best, you know, showcase for how good discovery is. But hopefully we'll find ourselves a gem or two. Darren Norman here uh, has held steady and looks to be a really good contact guy. Could have at least solid power against lefties. I think we finish off this profile and this is what we do for week nine. Darren Norman up to 95% is up to 17 on our board. Don't know if this is, you know, a top 10 caliber player just because his potential very unlikely to hit a and he's probably going to be more of a low 60s overall player. So, you know, if he's there in the second round, absolutely in the mix for us. I just don't know if he's there, uh, you know, good option at eight overall. We finally found a position player in discovery. Was he good? No, he was terrible. Dang, we are having bad, bad luck. This just might be one of those classes that doesn't have a lot good in discovery. Vernon Ruiz, on the other hand, looking very solid for us. Um... Looks like we need a little bit more with our central scouting, though. We're not quite there. All right. We're taking a look at another guy who's probably not going to be a first round option, but maybe a good second round one. Just a potentially awesome, awesome defensive catcher. Um, really weird draft. You know, this is not my preferred draft to show you all my scouting method. Who knows? It might turn out really good in the last few weeks, but... So far, we're looking just a little bit uh, sketchy here. Okay, we finally discovered somebody that's pretty interesting here in Irwin Navarro. Could be a serious, serious power hitter at third base. Discovered him doing infield east. Might do that area once more. I think we're now ready to start scouting individual pitchers here. We've kind of done two of the... Two of the regions that we really wanted now we can kind of fill in the gaps of what we like there's still william van dyke we haven't scouted i think he's worth at least taking a look at although he's 
Rejected top four, but top three by MLB, excuse me. Don't think he makes it to eight, but he's also going to be 100% in one week. So I think it's worth doing it just in case he does fall. And we got somebody good. Maybe we'll switch to outfield now. Uh, might go back to infield one more time, though, just because it did work out for us. But here's the week 11 plan. We're getting to the nitty gritty here. All right, week 12, we found out William Van Dyke is injured, but he's also really flipping good. Unlikely to make it to us, but maybe the fact that he's injured will mean he does. We'll get to this guy in a second. We need to find somebody else to uh, scout with our pitching. So we have only 80% on this guy. We could finish off this profile. Is it worth it? To get that extra 20% or do we know enough here? I think we could come back to this one. This guy opted out, which is a little sketchy. Um, this is a big riser. I'm, I want to finish off this one. He's, got, he's a pretty big riser here. I want to get one more week on Erman Navarro, but you saw somebody that will be scouting for sure. Connie Kemp. Finally, we've discovered a guy that turned out to be top 10 on our board. Connie Kemp, I mean, just looks great. He's going to be the guy that we scout next week for sure. And then I think, like I said, we're going to go back one more time to the infield East well. Uh, the East has been more kind to us than any other region so far in Discovery. And we'll do this. Here we are, just two weeks left to scout. Erwin Navarro and gonna end up at number 61 on our board. Power hitter could be worth a, a swing in the middle rounds if he remains on the board, but you know where we're going now. It looks like we scouted another good player here, although this is an example. That potential is only seven higher than his overall, so not gonna be a very high potential guy. If we scouted him, his draft rank, I would bet, would go down but still could be worth a mid-round selection. Somebody that I don't think we'd actually need to scout to really um, know where he lies. Let's go Connie Kemp here and let's switch up this. Is there a really cool reliever or closer that we discovered? We found Rodney Ayers, although again, that range is not good. There was a guy that I saw late here, Sean Morris. Let's get some scouting on him. We get 69% nice on Connie Camp. And the East has been pretty kind to us. We'll go back to outfield one more time. And we have made it to the final week of scouting. Connie Camp, continue to scout him. He continues to look good. Basically offers everything but power, you know? And that's fine. Um, honestly, he looks like the best position player that we've seen in the class. So here you go. If you're not liking what you're seeing from a class, sometimes Discovery can come in at the ninth hour and save you and give you somebody that looks really good. I want to finish off his scouting reports with our last thing here. Who did we discover? Nobody good here. Let's go with a flyer. Let's do Outfield International. See if we can't get anybody there. Um, and then let's change this guy here. Let's find that starter that was pretty high ranked, Castillo or Guzman. I think one of these guys we should finish off their profile. We'll go Castillo here. Just because he's opted out, we can see what his injury risk is by getting that last percentage. And that's going to wrap up the scouting. I'll see you at the draft. It is officially draft day and we are ready to make our selections. Um, and just put, put players on our board. Joel Trejo, if he falls a little bit, you could get the number two player in the class. Castillo, we got some more on him. Turns out I, my face cam is blocking it, but his injury list risk is low, so no risk in him opting out. He looks like a really solid option. Uh, we have a lot of pitchers that we think are, are you know, worthy of a selection at number eight overall. Likely going to be more of a pitcher first into a position player next kind of draft. Van Dyke. It's risky drafting injury, injured players, but 
he looks insane despite his age if he does make it to us. Um, Vernon Ruiz, our top discovery guy here. If we can get him with our second or third pick, that'd be insane. Um, Connie Camp, if we're looking for position players, this is as good as it's going to get in this class. Um, Andres Escalona is interesting for sure. Just kind of going through if uh, Norman makes it past the first round. I'm interested. And Skiambi will put on the board more of a guy that I'd take in the middle rounds. Here's a fun closer that I didn't know that we had scouted. So we can put more guys on our board later. But for now, I'm going to put these guys plus these fun second baseman on our board and let's get to the draft see who we can come up with i would say i'm less confident in this draft than i have been in others um, we're picking number eight i would say yeah a little bit below average confidence from what i typically get just because of the lack of position players that i really like joel treo does not even get close to fall falling to us um so the top ranked guy by our scouts of the guys that are available is off the board. I'm just kind of looking at my notes of the draft here. Going through all 14 weeks at once, if I didn't take notes, there was no way I was going to be able to keep up with what was going on. Garrett Bronk ended up not finishing off his scouting report. Going to be a good defensive center fielder, I think, for the Reds, or at least solid. Jack Smoove goes... That looks like a really solid range. You can't scout everybody at pitcher, unfortunately. Uh, yeah, he looks like he could, he could be pretty good. Uh, I'm just going to simulate to our pick here. Did anybody else get sniped? Uh, William Van Dyke does go. Anderley already, dude. I was hoping he was the guy that I was hoping we could get later on in the class. So we can get the guy that we have at number three in the class here in Antonio Castillo. Um, three bitch mix could be a fun pitcher. The question is, do we go for Connie Kemp? We have a lot of pitchers that we've scouted, not nearly as many position players. Castillo could also be available, you know, at pick 44. There's a chance Connie Kemp didn't get discovered by anybody else. We could get him later. I think this is actually pretty tough. There's also Ruiz. You don't mind terrible velocity. And for the purposes of this video, I'm just trying to get players that have really good potential and overall so I can make my strategy look good, right? I don't care about using them in franchise necessarily. So I think we're going to go with Castillo here and hope that... Oh, whoops. I accidentally removed him from the board rather than drafting him. We're going to hope that the position players that we like make it around. Here we go. Connie Camp is still on the board. Phelps is as well. I want to see where he is on the draft board. 64. So he's not going to make it to the next pick. We could get guaranteed a potential here. Camp might make it. So we're going to get a little bit risky here. You can with discovery players. Oftentimes they'll go because it just takes one other team in the draft discovering them for them to go. But if no one else discovered them, we had this situation in my Rockies draft very recently where we had some discovery guys not get discovered by anybody else. And so you can get some insane value down the board. I'm going to go with Phelps just because guaranteed a potential and not going to be there for the next pick. So there you have it. Kemp remains on the board. It does pay off for us. Let's draft him onto the team. So far, like in the class, Vernon Ruiz is on the board as well. Another top 10 player. This is exactly why you discover. We were able to get guys that were top 10 on our board in the picks past the top 50 because we discovered players. It's just, I think, the best way to get value down the board um, in these classes. Time for us, I think, to go get another pitcher here. So we'll go Ray Gonzalez. We've gotten two pitchers, two position players so far. Scamby does go. This is where I would have taken him. Uh, David Kwan 
top 30 player on our board. Um, what's the difference here? So Carrillo Carrillo is likely to be a little bit better now, but maybe lower. Is there any good reliever? We do have one good reliever here. Couple. I'm thinking we go with like none of these guys are going to be a potential, right? We're kind of done with the a potential unless Darnell Finley is literally the absolute max. Although since he's the only one that even has a chance, let's go for it. Why not? Didn't scout him. And then we'll go with. We just go. We would, do we double up on relievers? So we took two starters, two relievers, two position players in the class. Although three position players because we had that extra round two selection. Um, I think we could just trust the board here. Walks per nine is too low. If I was doing this in franchise, I wouldn't take him just because of that walks per nine. I was doing this for, you know, a long-term franchise that I was doing. That guy's going to be too low. I know I'm taking way too long for a six-round pick. Let's just finish this draft up. Kind of like what I'm seeing here from Carrillo. Geronimo Carrillo. So that's going to wrap up our draft here. And got to sign these players. Another benefit, I think, of doing it this way is you'll often find that a lot of the guys that you take have really high interest in joining you just because when you discover guys, they tend to just like your team and you'll end up taking, I mean, look at this, 87%, 86%, 69%, nice, right off the rip. I mean, we're signing the first stage. We've got half of our class signed. We got two more guys in the 80s already. I mean, first day we've got most of our class signed. There's one guy or two. If he decides not to sign, he does. There's literally one guy that we didn't sign. The one guy that we didn't scout, you know, is the only guy that, that, that we couldn't sign in the first period. So that's another kind of hidden benefit of doing the scouting in this way. So I guess we got to go one more here. Yep. And then he's at 55. We might get all this done. Bada bing, bada boom. Let's see who how these guys are rated. And here we are at the end of the draft. And it looks absolutely, absolutely insane draft class for us. 66 overall, 96 potential. Trusted the scouts. He was the number one player on the board. And they were right. This guy's nuts. Mark Phelps, 23 years old. I don't care. 66 overall, 97 potential. What the heck, dude? That's insane. Uh, Connie Kemp, he ends up being by far the lowest so far, but still a really good player. Um, Going to be an asset in the, in the field. He really does everything except for power. Honestly, everything except for power. I didn't look at these guys' durability. 55s, 60s, okay. 74 is good. Uh, Vernon Ruiz, 69, nice with 89 potential. Ray Gonzalez, 58. That's kind of the high 50s is kind of the lowest that I really try to find. I don't try to find anybody mid 50s or below. It just takes them too long. High 50s, you can get behind. That they'll be in your franchise before it's over. And then we just took a couple flyers here at the end. You know, the fifth and sixth rounds, you're you're lucky if you get good players there. But if you can get Good picks in rounds one through four of these drafts and nail all four of those rounds. You're going to have success in your franchise. And I think this method that I've shown you today is going to help you a lot with that. Discovery is key. You're not always going to have good discovery players. And that is when this strategy is going to struggle a little bit because I mean, Ruiz, Camp, we're both Discovery guys. I think Ray Gonzalez was as well, if I'm not mistaken. So, you know, th these three picks, that's really where Discovery is going to shine is in your middle rounds. Um, you can typically find guys that are on the MLB board for the first couple of rounds that are going to be good. But it's these picks that are really hard in this game because you only have 14 weeks to scout. But this strategy, I think, will help mitigate a lot of that struggle for you. So um, the last thing I want to do is I want to show you layered 
Let's look for a Laird. Because he was our poster child for showing that he's not going to be as good as he looks. Where is our boy Laird? Don't tell me he went unsigned. That would be so sad. Doug Laird. There you go. C potential. Really good starting point, but he's almost as good as he's going to be. He's only going to go up plus five, which is what his, his range told you. I mean, 63 to 93 potential. That looks really, really good, but it's always, always, always going to come in on the low end of those ranges. This one ended up kind of almost towards the middle, actually, but um, this is like the best case scenario for those guys is that they start in the 70s overall and then get a tiny bit better from that. So that's going to wrap up what I've got for you for tips and tricks to nail your draft selections in MLB The Show 24. Let me know if the strategy works for you. Let me know if you have any questions because certainly it's hard to tell from just one draft class if it's going to work. So if you're confused by anything that I said, I'd be happy to clarify in the comments below. Drop a like on the video if it's been informative. And if you like MLB The Show franchise mode, I'm doing a draft only rebuild franchise series whatever the you know a big long series draft only with the colorado rockies on mlb the show 24 having a ton of fun doing it and i had a, a draft in the first year pretty similarly good to what you're seeing here this one might actually be a tiny bit better if i'm being honest for a draft that i wasn't super confident in we ended up getting a major major haul but all i can say here at the end is thank you for watching the video again like the video subscribe to the channel and i'll see you soon